All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming this evening to Pattern Recognition with Camila Janan Rashid and Cheng Yu Chen. Uh, my name is Lily Hearn Foundation. I'm the Programs Manager at Q Art Foundation. Um, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping notes um, before we begin. Um, one is just please keep your microphone muted throughout this. It'll help the audio quality for everybody involved. Um, Second is we're going to start with presentations from uh, Yu Chen and then Camila, and then they're going to have a conversation with one another. If we have some time at the end, we can open it up to some audience Q&A. And at that point, you can either type your questions in the chat and we can read them, or you can uh, use the raised hand function and we can call on you and unmute you. So either one of those works. Um, and yeah, thanks for being here. We're going to start off with uh, Cheng Yu Chen. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. It's good to see your faces and names. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Josie and QR Foundation. And thank you, Camila, for stopping by my studio after I ran into you in my small car uh, at the cafeteria. And that was early March when I just started my residency, which soon turned into a deep quarantine, a retreat of complete solitary, two months of spiriting away an exhibition you were installing, which I never got a chance to see, I imagine, is breathing quietly behind the museum's locked gate, exhibiting only cult value, whose sheer existence is more potent than visibility. Until this day, that was my last actual studio visit. <laughs> we talked much. I remember feeling my brain racing. We started from my project Coral Dictionary, but then all things are connected and the conversation diverged into all things. Concepts do not build a continuum of operations. Thought does not advance in a single direction. Rather, the aspects of the argument interweave as in a carpet. The fruitfulness of the thoughts depends on the density of this texture. Adorno said so about essay as form. I think it can also be applied to another employment of language, conversation. In a conversation, other than the things people say, there are also ways of delivery, the word they choose, whispering their private history in relation to the public glossary, the order of words they arrange, rendering their mind, mind map of classification, hierarchy, the tonality they perform, expression, emphasis, irony, urgency, and a whole range of feelings just in between one and one's own speech. And double that, since there were you and me. And multiply that by how many times our words encountered, collided, and changed their trajectories. Concurrent to every conversation, there's always an undercurrent of learning and teaching. Gradually, unconsciously, and yet collaboratively, we re-angle, refocus, reshape our personal dialects, sending one's utterance towards the other's literacy. And now, in respect, in retrospect, in comparison, I see even more layers of texture. The way you were seated in relation to me, your hand laid next to my notebook. You walked towards my drawings and then back further away. I wrote down the Chinese character wall and we looked at it together. I just realized what makes Zoom meetings so exhausting recently. In communicating to another human being, so much information is nonverbal and yet they construct a magnet, magnet field where the verbal can move with gravity, with meaning, now, no matter how close I lean towards my screen, my words seem to disperse into the void. Have they landed? How they landed? I just can't know. Which actually is not a new sensation to me. Nine years I've lived in the US, I still sometimes feel like I can't hear myself when speaking English. A friend once commented that I could be utterly blunt I thought to myself with a little melancholy, he will never know how crafted I can be in concealing my true intention when speaking Chinese, despite the depths of our friendship. In this foreign linguistic territory, 
I don't have with me. My measurement, my confidence, my ease. My voice is much more tentative. My sentences often go up in tone at the end, because besides whatever I am saying, I am also forever asking, am I saying what I think I am saying? Do you understand me? And maybe that is part of the reason why I choose to live and work here. Linguistically, I get to be a child again. All words come to me anew. We have no history to each other. Our relationship, rootless and free. I did not master English, but I am mastering inferiority, the art of understatement, the space I create in detachment, the opacity of my soul that I preserve from what I say, the technique of stretching time. Whenever I take a long pause, close or blow up my eyes in search for a word, my friends would always wait for me in silence. We concentrate on the moment of vacuum, of disorientation, as well as liberation from the usually unstoppable stream of signifying. I moved to Queens two weeks ago, and I told Lily with great excitement that I moved to the world. In my hood, there's Islamic culture center, Tibetan restaurant, Romanian church, Turkish grill, Japanese grocery stores. I noticed around me a whole population operating my tricks. We're not at home, but we've settled in our not at homeness. The conversations that I overhear are also beautiful, freshly made in that morning at a counter, every word instrumentalized with clear purposes and originality. And very often, on top of everything, a great sense of humor carried out in this language that was imposed to the world as neutral, as universal, through hundreds of years of epistemic violence. Isn't it resistance then to use it, to have fun with it, to fragmentize it, synthesize it, privatize it, color it? The marginalia, the anarchic singularities and the inefficiencies which generative transformational grammars leave to one side or attempt to cover with ad hoc rules may in fact be among the nerve centers of linguistic change. As a turbulent dust cloud and a black spot in the galaxy are, on present evidence, the intricate locale of the formation of stars. I remember at the end of our last conversation, Camila, you said that sometimes you feel translation is a selfish act, as if we are pulling things towards us, filtering them through our system. This imagery was so strong, so vivid, and so shocking to me. Why have I never thought of it? Yesterday I understood, because I am the one being translated. I was pulled out of my mother tongue, filtered through the system of Disney, Woody Allen, Velvet Underground, Freud, Marx, Allen Ginsberg, Walter Benjamin, Marcel Duchamp. China was never colonized to the point of losing its own language, unlike many other places. But culture came to me directionally, as if there's a point of transcendence, as if the sound that's hanging outside of Plato's cave. Naturally, I walked towards it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have forgotten that I hadn't said that thing about translation. Um, I say a lot of things and sometimes uh, <laughs> lose track of the things that I'm saying, but as you're repeating that, it does still resonate. Um, I'm really excited to uh, speak with you guys today. Uh, thank you also again to Q. Uh, thank you to you, Chen. Um, like she had noted, we ran into each other after having run into each other in another circumstance. Um, and so it's always nice running into you, Chen, because you always have like a new reading list uh, and a lot of new things to think about. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, before this conversation began sort of thinking about the starting places and sort of how we wanted to orbit around a particular set of ideas. Um, and so we started thinking about pattern recognition. And so I want to talk about pattern recognition uh, and translation and language through 
like three or four ideas or events that I've been thinking about. Uh, I'm going to show some slides very quickly. Uh, for anyone who's ever been to a talk that I've given, this is the smallest number of slides I've ever used in the entirety of my life as a person speaking. There are four slides. Uh, and I'm super excited about being concise. Uh, the goal today is just sort of to throw some things out so that uh, you and I can have a conversation and less organized around some firm statements. Um, I guess like one more piece that I would like to share. Um, I very much believe conceptually and spiritually that uh, we are forever in the process of learning. So I always like to give the preamble that this is what I think at this very moment. You may show up at another talk uh, that I give where I may say something different where um, I may have revised something. And that's sort of, a, I think, a divine uh, offering. This idea that you can constantly revise, that you can constantly learn, that you can constantly be in this process um, of making sense of the world because we don't know very much. We don't know anything at all. So today is just of an offering of what I think I think I know at this particular moment. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, is it? Alrighty. Um, so we're gonna talk about Zorana Hurston, who's amazing, obviously. We're gonna talk about something called the Oram Fatwa. Uh, we're going to talk about hawk moths, and we're also going to talk about monkeys. And I promise these are all related to um, pattern recognition. So in getting this prompt around pattern recognition, uh, there are a couple of things that I first thought about. I thought about what do we mean by pattern? Uh, what do we mean by recognition? So when I think about patterns, I think about something that has sort of a um, repetition or predictability that makes it easy to make sense of, right? There's something about the predictability of like, a pattern in the way that you spell certain words or a pattern in the way that you speak or a pattern in the way that something is sewn that makes it easily accessible. There's something about patterns and the transparency of such. And then there's recognition. And recognition is sort of this process of being able to not only see and perceive a particular pattern, but being able to then analyze and in some cases weaponize that particular pattern. And so for me, what um, I'm sort of grappling with are two things, sort of these technologies of repetition um, up against these technologies of surveillance, right? The idea to recognize something is also to have something under surveillance, to watch something, to study something, to hold something steady for observation, um, and sort of like what's at stake in those processes. And so I'm thinking about these questions of recognition, um, which also has a lot to do with translation because in the process of recognition, you're taking something and filtering it through your own lens. Um, I thought a lot about um, one of my favorite people, Zora Hurston, and thinking about this idea of Black folks and Black folks who are always up for study or theorizing um, or getting to know or, or research or experimentation. And so uh, this quote here that I have on the screen um, is from um, Of Mules and Men, where she is sort of talking about her research and, and exploring folklore. Um, and I'm going to read the whole, uh, most of the quote because I, it's one of my favorite quotes when I think about these ideas of pattern recognition and breaking patterns. Um, and so I'm going to start down here. Uh, the Negro offers a feather bed resistance. Uh, this is, we let the probe enter, but it never comes out. It gets smothered under a lot of laughter and pleasantries. The theory behind our actions. The white man is always trying to know into someone else's business. All right, I'll set something outside the door of my mind for him to play with and handle. He can read my writing, but he sure can't read my mind. I'll put this play toy in his hand and he will seize it and go away. Then I'll say my say and sing my song. Um, and I really love, love this excerpt because she's writing at this particular time where uh, Black folks um, very much are under a, a particular type of surveillance, the surveillance of being studied, um, being studied in this Jim Crow era, being studied uh, after slavery, just being under, being always constantly being the specimen of study. And it made me think a lot about these ideas of how a lot of theorizing relies on patterns and this idea of recognizing a particular set of patterns in order to then articulate a particular theory around how people organize themselves, what we can predict about their behavior, and then what that means as far as policy. And so for me, it was very interesting about this excerpt um, where she asks us about, um, where she says very clear, you see, we are a polite people. We do not say to our questioner, get out of here. We smile and tell him or her something that satisfies the white person because knowing so little about us, he doesn't know what he is missing. The reason why this is important is because when it comes to pattern recognition, something that often surfaces for me is this uh, tension, an important tension between what we present as an exterior pattern, how we present ourselves in exterior fashion under surveillance states, under surveillance regimes, and then what our interiority is. And so for me, when it comes to pattern recognition, um, adding another technology in there, it's not only the technology of repetition, 
it's not only the technology of perception and study, but it's also the technology of interiority, which is preserved and withheld and refused um, within the context of surveillance. Um, so I wanted to start there because I feel like, why not start with Zorna Hurston? Like, why not start with her? I want to move on uh, next to something um, that I came across by accident. And a lot of what I come across is often an accident. Um, I, during the day, I write uh, curriculum for social studies um, for high schools. Um, I work for a nonprofit. And one of the things I was writing curriculum around was this period in the 1500s and 1600s um, when there was both the rise of Christianity and Islam, um, but particularly in Spain, there were first con forced conversions for Jewish folks and Muslim folks to Christianity. Um, and some people chose to convert, uh, some people chose to flee, uh, some people chose to fight, um, but for the folks who wanted to stay um, and fight, but co fight covertly, um, something uh, sort of gave them this permission. And this was called something uh, called the Oran Fatwa. And the Oran Fatwa was this fatwa that was issued uh, to Muslims, a very particular fatwa. Fatwa was sort of a ruling of what's permissible um, in this context. And it basically said uh, that Muslims uh, at this particular time in this region were allowed to, in their exterior representation, uh, be Christian while interiorly uh, still practicing Islam. And so what I found really interesting about this with regard to pattern recognition is the ways in which we can sort of jam up a system through presenting a pattern that is recognized in a particular way, while again preserving a particular interiority. And so in this context, uh, Muslims who, uh, practice, who are uh, practicing elements of Christianity um, in the exterior fashion basically would do things like they were encouraged if they had to curse the name of a prophet or the curse the name of Allah, uh, they basically had to intentionally mispronounce that name while they were muttering. If they wanted to make salat, which for us includes lots of different movements, um, and they didn't want to be seen doing that, they can engage in a set of micro movements. And so again, um, when people are looking for particular patterns that are visible and known, um, this opens you up for uh, surveillance. Um, and so in this case, this becomes really exciting and fascinating for me as an example of pattern recognition where the system is being jammed by these other sort of signals being sent out, which are signals that are almost like false flags. Um, and so there's so much more that's really interesting about this factual. If you just want to look up the Oran factual tonight in your free time, uh, I encourage it. Um, but again, what's fascinating about this is a 1500, um, 1500s document that's thinking about sort of these um, very low key and subversive politics around uh, presentation and surveillance in the 1500s. Whoops, got there a little too soon. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about um, is my longstanding interest in uh, non human animals. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, again, my interest in surveillance. I hope you're noticing a theme here. Uh, when I think about pattern recognition, I'm thinking about algorithms, I'm thinking about surveillance, I'm thinking about being watched. I'm thinking about literally jamming um, both the technology of pattern and jamming the technology of being able to perceive said patterns. Um, and so I started looking to non-human animals uh, to sort of identify the ways in which non-human animals um, have engage in these patterns um, of non-patterning uh, in order to protect themselves and thinking again about um, the awareness and the intelligence of non-human animals who uh, understand pattern recognition, understand the need to improvise, as many of us do who are marginalized, how to improvise around uh, systems or surveillance. Um, and so there are tons of articles you look online uh, around sneaky animals or animals that are trying to get by or do like kooky things and what's funny about these headlines is that these animals are not being sneaky. They're doing what they need to do to survive because we're nosy. Um, and so a lot of what we know about animal behavior comes from surveillance of animals. <laughs> Drones, uh, microphones, I just read a story about uh, someone strapping some type of uh, video device to, I can't remember which sad organism it was, uh, so that they could capture more information. Um, but all this is interesting to me because two things have uh, arisen. Um, out of this, one is that uh, non-human animals have adapted to identify the ways in which they can evade our surveillance, right? Uh, and they also identify ways they can evade the surveillance of predators. Um, my first example, and it's one that I love because I learned about this at a time where I was writing really bad um, Black Mirror-esque uh, <laughs> fiction. I'm still writing. Let's not pretend I'm not still writing. I'm still writing it. I just don't share it. Um, but in this particular circumstance, I read a study about these cotton bottom tamarind monkeys 
um, who were in captivity and they were being studied for how they communicate. Um, and the researchers were super confused. They're like, they're not saying anything. Uh, in the beginning when a human who they consider to be a predator walked into the room, they would mob or get really loud. But then they kept saying like, we don't, we can't, they're not doing anything. So they kept doing the study and they kept sort of trying to pick up what was going on and finally found out these lovely monkeys had figured out how to whisper. And what's super interesting about this is, again, them being very aware of the patterns that the people studying them had become aware of, had to then figure out another way to communicate outside of the patterns that had already been recognized. Unfortunately, our human technology uh, then was able to <laughs> uh, figure out the frequency at which to perceive this whispering, but it's a really interesting example of the ways in which, again, non-humans and humans are trying to constantly find ways to jam up the system when it comes to patterns. Um, and then the second example before I close um, is this really interesting example um, of these hawk moths, um, which this is like, I, if I, sorry, you can tell I'm getting very geeked and excited about this, but I've never found anything more exciting than this. Basically these hawk moths um, vibrate their genitalia to interrupt the echolocation of bats. So basically in order to be, avoid being attacked by a bat, they vibrate their genitals in order to send out a different type of sonar signal. And I was like, wow, that is an amazing, amazing, amazing use of genitalia and an amazing, amazing thing that was uncovered uh, in this process of scientific research. Uh, but also just made me sad about issues around like mystery and discovery. Um, but I mentioned these two things again as these sort of um, reminders of again, ways in which um, we exist in this ecosystem where we're constantly um, under surveillance or watching someone else's patterns in order to weaponize them and the ways in which we sort of work outside um, of those patterns in order to seek some type of liberatory future for ourselves as humans and non-humans. Um, the last thing um, while we're in the Black Mirror-esque context that I wanted to mention, hopefully everyone has uh, seen this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com as a generative adversarial network, which basically uh, uses uh, AI in order to create uh, photographs of people who don't actually exist. So they take in uh, a data set of uh, pre-existing images and features, and they create these faces um, that don't actually, these people that don't actually exist. So every time you refresh this page, this person does not exist.com, you'll see a new face of a fictional person. Obviously, this has all type of sinister uses, but what's interesting to me about this with regard to pattern recognition is the ways in which, again, um, we are to think about what data we hand over uh, to institutions um, and the ways in which we can introduce uh, what Hito Cero mentions in her article, um, this idea around dirty data, data that intentionally disrupts the system by not uh, conforming to the format or template that is needed and therefore becomes useless. Um, and so these are just sort of my offerings around pattern recognition. Um, I guess I just want to end on this note of sort of thinking about um, how comforting patterns are. Uh, patterns show up obviously in, in storylines. A plot is really beautiful pattern. We know that something's going to happen, that something's going to be resolved, and there's going to be conflict. There are tons of patterns uh, that we're really familiar with and they create great comfort. Um, but I think we're at a very interesting moment where patterns don't serve us. And this is an opportunity to think about the ways in which pre-existing patterns and plot tropes uh, can be broken and sort of offer um, us up new ideas of futurity. And so, um, yeah, maybe we can hop into a conversation around patterns and futurity and what does it mean to not uh, rely on an imagination that's rooted in uh, pattern making, um, if that question makes sense. I think that's all I have. Thanks, guys. Let me unshare my screen. I think you're muted. Oh. I, I was muted. It's you and I. <laughs> I'm back. Um, just for folks out there, we're going to chat for a little bit, and then we're also going to have questions. So if you do have questions or comments, just um, you know, stick around, and we're going to talk. All righty. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a lot. I'm very overwhelmed by the spectrum of the information. <laughs> just um, led the tour. But I think currently I'm thinking, for one, how I can can relate myself to how I instrumentalize my inferiority in this linguistic environment to the brilliant non-human animals, how they change the 
their skin or the shape of their contour, mm -hmm. how, how resourceful and cunning they are, but also not out of a necessity just to um, navigate the surrounding. Most of the time, a hostile or mm -hmm. hostile surrounding. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think um, I, I think the, that list of these sort of agile adaptations um, surface almost like unintentionally. Like I, I very much believe in like running into things and that that being important and and, and chance sort of um, engagements. And I hadn't noticed. I just kept collecting mm -hmm. these examples, and I couldn't figure out why these examples were so interesting to me. And it was to this point around this agility uh, and this deep responsiveness to your environment. Um, and being mindful also of the ways in which we prioritize, we as humans center ourselves in every conversation and in every discourse and every ecosystem, which means that we're constantly thinking about how we learn from one another. But as I'm like getting deeper, deeper, deeper into a lot of like surveillance studies as it pertains to um, non-human animals and also thinking about like language and translation with interspecies communication, it reminds me of how much there is to be learned from non-human animals, but also the ways in which our actions and behaviors as humans have pushed non-human animals um, into these unfortunate interactions <laughs> um, with, with us and with one another. Yes, I think it's a very similar movement or uh, relationship between Siri and their life, between yeah. human and, and non-human non animals, between, yeah. for example, the um, English grammar and other rather minority language, which has been throughout the history analyzed in comparison to English in relation to English. Yeah, it's, and I, oh, go, no, go ahead. <laughs> I think your attention to these margins, to this um, um, stars compared to the center is mm -hmm. a similar uh, span of attention, a generosity, and as you said, the offering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you were, so at the end of your talk, you talked about, um, talked about our conversation around translation as this like selfish act. And I wanted to return to that because I think about that also with how um, sometimes I feel like I have a lack of language around talking about uh, non-human species, right? This idea that they, they are called non-human because we're referring to them as something as opposed to us versus as what they are, right? So they're non-human, which, you know, so there's that interesting point for me, but there's also the ways in which we translate non-human animal behavior um, through our own anthropomorphic lens, right? So like a uh, animal, uh, a snake is being sneaky. And I'm like, the snake is not being sneaky because the snake is not, a, <laughs> a, a snake is not taking on human characteristics. The snake is being a snake, right? Um, and so I'm really interested in translation as something that is like, it does feel selfish to me because it, and, 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 and I don't mean translation in the sense of like the more bureaucratic like access to information translation, but I do mean in the case of when uh, someone is trying to make sense, I guess I mean translation in the literal and more conceptual way that instead of trying to make sense of someone's experience or to make sense of someone's narrative through the context or through their vocabulary or through their sort of atmosphere or climate, we're trying to displace that from their climate and, and their context, put it into ours and then filter it through a set of like legible signs that make sense to us. So by the time we, we receive it and by the time we make sense of it, it's no longer the thing that it actually was, right? And so I think translation in the context of like me trying to translate a book into another language for the purpose of sharing it, um, even that gets wonky because there's all types of like political and, and cognitive things that happen in, in that particular realm. But I think, I don't know, there's this question for me of like what should be translated, what isn't supposed to be translated, are some things not supposed to be understood by everyone, uh, this sort of push to translate everything into English, when like maybe that like indigenous community had no intention of anyone outside of like those 600 people ever reading or understanding it because it wasn't for us, right? And so uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm curious to hear from you if you think about like when it comes to questions of patent recognition and power and surveillance um what's translation are there things that you feel like should never be translated i think on the literal sense um my view of translation as 
as a practice of literature, of theory, is with modern Benjamin. I think it purifies a piece. It gives it new life. It takes us back to the broken vase. His idea of pure language being one vase, but then each language is one fragment. I really believe translating back and forth. Also, that's the way I live now. Mm-hmm. It to wash out um, history's baggage, uh, which is a loss apparently, but also again in the way that it it's light and it's new. Mm-hmm. But I'm really fascinated by how you describe the way we translate animals' characters into the realm of meaning we can understand. I think we also do that to ourselves. When we talk mm-hmm. about feelings, we will have to crop it. We will have to summarize it, simplify it. And we have to find hierarchy of the feelings, which is most important when there's contradiction, which is all the time. And when we talk about a dream, I had this habit to write down my dreams but as I'm writing I feel like water running out of my hands because mm-hmm. I'm, writing, I'm losing the imagery the ambiguity I am translating it at the same time forever lost or original mm-hmm. it is a dangerous act but it is it is all we do even when I'm under in me understanding you what does Camila mean when she says this word is different from someone else by talking to you three times now four times now i know a little bit more and yeah. i was trying to give you a knowledge of my context the ecology of my language when i say a word i hope you can place it in this uh, environment and between classes between occupations i came here to study art i don't know word i don't know animals names <laughs> i don't know vegetables names and I have friends who send me texts. I have to look up an urban dictionary mm-hmm. that I've had before. And I recently just started to text them back in Chinese. Why do I have to do all the work? Mm-hmm. I easily look up on Google. It just takes a second, which I do all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think that's super interesting. And, and it's, it's kind of a nice flex <laughs> to be like, I'm going to message you back in Chinese. You do it. I, I, I think then, and if I, if I am, as I noted at the beginning of this talk, I'm constantly revising as I'm speaking. So this is like maybe the moment of revision for me. Maybe it's not that I think that translation itself is selfish. I think maybe the, the, the instrumentalizing of translation for complete clarity feels selfish, right? The idea that we're translating for the purpose of perfectly understanding versus just for like a moment or a glimpse. Because I think that maybe that's where I get a bit frustrated. This is idea that we're going to translate everything because we have the right to a complete understanding of something else rather than sort of surrendering to like the fact that this was rendered in a language that you do not have access to and that this translation only will get you like 13% of anywhere near what the person was thinking about is also okay. And so maybe the, the selfishness is around the intention behind the translation. That's maybe that's what I, yeah, maybe that's where I'm kind of like, I don't, I feel a bit like, meh, like <laughs> what, what is the intention behind the translation? And who has the right to, to translate? Cause I was, who has the right to receive a translation? I was on uh, Twitter, um, I'm a terrible tweeter. I like tweet out random things and my account has eight followers. Um, but <laughs> one of the tweets that I saw recently that I really enjoyed, the, the question was, um, what's considered trashy if you're poor, but considered um, like upper class if you're like more wealthy, right? And uh, one, of the, one of the things that someone had written was speaking two languages. And I thought that was really interesting, the idea that if you speak multiple languages and you're poor, then that's some type of deficit, like you don't, that you had to learn English, you had to learn the majority language, but if you are upper class and you have access to money and wealth um, and a certain amount of privilege, then learning, having known two languages puts you, makes you like a better person. So sort of thinking about this dichotomy of like, at what point is translation considered like a really beautiful, wonderful uh, thing that's like imbued with like uh, race and, and wonderful things. And at what point, is it considered like this bureaucratic thing we have to do for people that don't want to do what we ask them to do? Because I think that uh, some of us are afforded access to translations as like a graceful offering, and some of us are afforded translations almost as like um, 
there's a sense of resentment associated with it. Like I'm angry that you can't speak this, whereas other people are not sort of facing that type of interaction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I don't yeah, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> it's a it's a such broad practice. It can yeah. be within one part, it can be between one culture and the other, between a whole population, a, na a nationality and another nationality or two different ways of thinking. I think the I can totally get what's selfish about it and, and the arrogance and uh, just silly to believe that the version you have at hand can be truthful, that you can obtain a truth that's not generated in this, um, you can obtain someone's truth that's not generated by their time, their space, their reality, their language. Yeah. Mm. And one one of the things that we talked about when we were together um, that one time we thought the world was never going to change. Uh, uh, we talked about um, how both of us were sort of like peeking into these ways that people were taking um, sort of these formal languages and finding new symbols and new sort of ways to hack it or to have covert uh, conversations. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the example that you shared with me uh, during our visit. Oh, there was. Uh, it was an interesting moment. It was for me in between two pandemics because mm -hmm. I experienced it twice and also through a totally different system. I was in China in January and I came back quarantined myself for 14 days when nobody around me understood why. And then it started here. So when I met you, my brain was still attached to the pandemic there. And mm -hmm. at that moment, there were a lot of discussions about how government um, resent about how government handled it. And there was an interview from a doctor in Wuhan. Uh, she revealed a lot of detailed facts, the instructions she got and the limitation of her act. And this, of course, interview was banned immediately. And people started to repost it uh, with slightly altered, with all languages, like with Arabic alphabet, with German, in Greek, all sorts of languages. And then in this Huaxing which is a language, it is Chinese, but it's a teenager's Chinese. Mm. It does subtract or add a little bit more to the word. You can still recognize it. It's wrong, but you can still read the whole sentences. Mm -hmm. I remember showing you that, and you connected that to the coding, um, the logic of coding, of how taking information away is also a way of communicating. And mm -hmm. I... You mentioned that in your slideshow about purposefully mispronounce something mm -hmm. and that mistake a new word, a mistake become a new signifier having mm -hmm. an independent meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, when you told me about the example, I got so excited because I think there are these examples of people doing this throughout history that are well documented. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think about sort of like covert modes of communication. Uh, all the obviously ones that are never documented because they're covert, right? This idea that there's a mountain of ways that people have been engaging um, under states of surveillance in order to make sure that messages are read and messages are received. And it makes me really excited when we think about this idea of like translation and language where we're to be uh, literate and to be multilingual in this particular context I think brings up something very different, this idea that someone could uh, be able to write in English, but be also able to write in a particular mode of English that is perceptible by a certain group of people that's also perceptible by another. <laughs> I just think there's something really interesting to think about language development um, and linguistics in this context, because I think um, it's like, it, it really, really messes with attempts at surveillance uh, when we really think about the multitude of ways that I could send a message to you without actually revealing what I'm trying to say to you it makes me really excited um, for the social movements that are happening now. And I guess maybe that's a question that I have is, is sort of around um, something I've been thinking a lot about around sort of the optics of social movements at this point uh, where things are hyper visible. I'm wondering around, I'm wondering about sort of the interplay between sort of hyper visible organizing and communication and what role more covert communication plays um, in a moment like this. Could you say more about that? 
Yeah. So I, um, so I, I, maybe I'll back up a little bit. So in 2015, um, I had a bunch of PTO and I was like, you know what, I'm going to Istanbul, Turkey. At that time I wasn't married. I, I didn't have a lot of responsibilities. I was just like, I'm going to Istanbul. And we were going to the airport. It was Newark airport. And I heard my name called over the speaker and I was like, maybe I'm getting an upgrade. So I go to the front desk and they're like, oh, where are you going? And I explain like, duh, I'm going to Istanbul because duh, I'm in the gate for Istanbul. Um, and then this whole process ensues where my bags are searched. I'm asked like 1500 questions. I get searched again. Uh, I get put on the plane. I get pulled off the plane. I get questioned by FBI. I get questioned by tons of people. And so it was in that moment that I remember I had sent a, a text message to a bunch of people with a picture of the pe people who were questioning me. And I remember sending a tweet, a tweeter, a tweet, a tweet, a tweet, <laughs> and an Instagram post with this information saying, uh, if you don't hear from me in this number of hours, please contact Newark Airport, look for this person, ask for the name, blah, blah, blah. And I remember at that time how much I wish I had a way of communicating with someone else in the airport or someone else nearby or someone else over my phone to communicate some type of strategy for getting myself out of a very unsafe situation and feeling like I didn't have that. And so when I think about um, sort of how things are happening now, I'm super curious about the ways in which um, we create or revive or re-engage with sort of covert ways of communication that are not reliant on digital technology or not reliant on visibility in order to make sure that people are safe and are avoiding detection. Um, and I don't know any answers, but it's something that I keep thinking about at this time of hyper visibility. Where does uh, a refusal of visibility, where does a refusal um, mm -hmm. of, of tracing, refusal of being present, refusal of, of uh, perceptibility play into all of this because mm. it is a pattern of showing up and then what happens when you withdraw or refuse that showing up yes i remember when i was in hong kong last summer and on the subway i got airdrop information of protests at next gathering and walking down the tunnel of the train i see small piece of paper writing clear explanations of the five demands and then mm. In January, I got dropped of instructions of how to wash hands. Mm -hmm. I find people do have resourceful ways to communicate, and even within the realm of digital communication, mm -hmm. there are apps that protesters use. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking of this uh, documentary of Tibetan salt men uh, made in the 80s. This group of men, they would fetch salt. The whole trip takes six months and they will fetch salt for the whole village once a year. And they have their language only between salt men. Other people can speak. And when I was in Malaysia, I've in talked about the intricate linguistic ecology of Malaysia, partially because of its scar-ridden history as colonization, but also just the ethnicity, ethnic uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. There's a language at a vegetable market. That's a mixture of Malay, English, and mm -hmm. Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, regional Chinese dialects. We and I also find even with the um, regular, the standard language, we can do so much with our tones and our mm -hmm. and emoji. There are so many ways we can communicate. That's contradictory to what we actually do. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Especially living in China, I feel like I live in this double reality. I grew up in this double reality. It was one that's dominant, but lie, just pure lie. And you just, it's everywhere and it's so forceful, but you ignore it. While you, well, uh, whoever actually surround me and my friends on the internet speaks completely another language. And we will have things of that, um, context and we will even use the words of that um, linguistic um, realm but we would use it in an ironic way and it's just so efficient in communicating. There was an artist book I saw in Hong Kong in January. It's actually a poem but written with journalism, with like TV uh, language, with that kind of authoritative but empty words. It was really hard for me to explain to my coworkers what the book was about because it's about two things at the same time. Yeah. 
language itself is pure bureaucratic bureaucracy, but the content is poetry. And just this distance and this tearing of these two reality is where the power of that text is. Yeah, I feel like that's such a beautiful way to think about um, the ways in which we're constantly, uh, you guys know those like Russian dolls that are sort of nested inside of themselves, sort of thinking about uh, constantly being nested in these different realities and needing sort of like a, a language to navigate every single uh, nesting reality that you might be in. And it makes me think of, again about um, what does it mean to speak multiple languages as not meaning the ability to speak English and Arabic and Spanish, but the ability to even change the intonation of your voice mm -hmm. in English or to be able to like um, mobilize a certain type of like irony or satire or like particular gestures with your body, which are all modes of communication. Um, and there's um, a book by Tina Camp uh, called Listening to Images where she talks about the idea of listening to images, which is like a very beautiful concept, but she has a part where she talks about sound and, and sort of these infrasounds, which are only perceptible by um, those who have the sort of percept perceptual technologies uh, to turn that sound into something that's understandable or legible. And it makes me think about two things. Uh, it makes me think about what does it mean to speak multiple languages, but what does it also mean to be able to listen and hear uh, to many different languages because you may be able to speak in many different ways, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the ability or willingness to hear. And I don't mean hear only with your ears, but hear in all the, the ways there is there are to perceive uh, meaning. What does that mean? Uh, if you're able to speak a lot, but not be able to hear a lot, you're still getting a very myopic version of the world. Um, so I, I guess it's, I don't know, I guess it's interesting to sort of think about the interplay between listening and speaking and the prioritization of like, how do we speak? But there's also this question for me of like, how do we listen as an important um, like political lever as well? How do we make ourselves, how do we make it such that we are able to hear yeah. more than just what reinforces what we think, but also how do we hear people who are not speaking in ways that are familiar to us that we may have rendered unimportant? Yes. Have the right tone. <laughs> um, right grammar acquisition window of sound is very really, really short i remember it ends before you are even one years old i remember the experiment made with a korean baby later adopted to canada if it happened before he was one when he hears korean language he hear it as sound but if it's over one years old this person will hear it as language it stimulates mm -hmm different part of the brain. And I think in my last example of the political language, I think I have to this point hear them just as sound. I don't even think of the meaning of the word anymore. I think it's the um, like how Marxism and then and how Soviet Union's history was translated into Chinese, how this hmm. 20 years of re revolution have calcified this language, made them slogan, making me growing up under this language, seeing them printed in gigantic fonts everywhere, go totally blind and deaf around. And, and it is also reminds me during my quarantine, in the first quarantine, uh, <laughs> when I was here and everyone was out and about in Brooklyn, Best Eye, and all my families of friends are burning in this anxiety and anger and fear. Mm. I was also jet lagging. So I was living on my phone, checking all social media platforms, constantly switching in between. And in daytime, I sleep and my radio is talking about impeachment nonstop. Mm. Hours and hours of impeachment. And it goes into my sleep. But for me, it was really just the background noise. Yeah. To this pandemic, to this to my friends who's completely concerned, can consume in this political discourse. I remember telling my friends that I have news addiction and she said, me too. And I immediately know she's not talking about the same news. Yeah. That's, yeah, I, I think uh, in the, um, just for, we, I think we both mentioned articles that are mentioned in the uh, event uh, description, but in the, 
the article that I was reading and thinking about this as well, uh, the Hito Cerro piece, uh, she talks about um, the political context of like what is considered background noise and what is considered like sort of foreground um, noise that should be rendered important and then like manifest into policy or manifested. And so when you were speaking, I was thinking about that excerpt of the article because it does remind me the ways in which uh, not all of us are working with the same sort of perceptual um, filters around what is noise and what is not noise, um, but how those perceptual filters are conditioned um, by who we are conditioned uh, to think, uh, who, what we are, how we are conditioned to think what is worth hearing or what is worth listening to, right? And I think to your point, you turn around fatigue, I think that's super important because I think there is a, a notion of, for me, around pattern recognition and fatigue, this idea that uh, you can hear something being said so many times in the same way that you become fatigued and literally tune it out and thinking about pattern breaking as sort of this like uh, sort of radical moment of improvisation that actually makes something uh, more or more with, I was going to say more hearable, but that's not really a phrase, but to make it something that pe that changes people's sort of like percept perceptual uh, scope, right? This idea of I keep hearing and then all of a something, all of a sudden something changes there. That might be a moment where I perk up. And so I think a lot about the ways in which political messaging is delivered, uh, the ways in which uh, as a former high school teacher, you think about the ways in which you deliver instruction and the ways that you have to sort of change every five minutes to make sure that there's a sense of a pattern, but the pattern that breaks in order to ensure that there's a cognitive facility that's engaging. And so I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in thinking about pattern breaking and relation to noise and the ways in which pattern breaking um, can render something that is noise or considered like excess, uh, it, moving it from the margin to the center, that moment of breaking or that moment of like um, refusing to go along with, I guess with that melody could be a really interesting moment. Oh, it's 558, I didn't even know how late it was. Go, sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna open it up for questions and I hadn't realized how late it was. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Stop. Um, well, do, well, if you have something to say, you should definitely say it. Last thing. <laughs> we talked about sound a little bit last time too, just how limited our ears are equipped to hear <laughs> wide range of vibrations. And I was thinking of a quote by Robert Ashley. He said, all musics are ethnic music. So Beyonce is also ethnic music. Just the word, word, word music compared to the classic music of Western tradition, all other musics are classified as world music, as if they are only like regional music. But Robert actually made the point that all music are regional. So mm -hmm. um, no matter how dominant they are around our years in every grocery store, but there are also sound we don't hear every day, instruments that's mm -hmm. not, but they are, they are pop songs to someone. Yeah, yeah. This is good. We're gonna definitely have to do another Zoom call with one another. We can't hold everyone here, but we did. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is awesome, and I have a lot of notes happening um, here. Uh, um, Lily, can we open it up for questions or comments? Yeah, definitely. At this time, if anybody uh, has any questions or comments, please uh, type it in the chat, raise your hand, we can unmute you, um, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody does have any questions, I, as the, you two were talking, I was just thinking a lot too about, um, and maybe Yuchen, you can speak to this a little bit, but uh, Camila, you were talking a lot about non-human animals and, and pattern, inter, like, you know, pattern recognition and disruption within non-human animals, but it made me think a lot about how, Yuchen, you're creating this whole coral alphabet and coral is actually an animal, that's it. So you're using this non-human animal to to kind of make human communication possible in this realm that I find very interesting. And uh, maybe you could just talk about that project a little bit while we're seeing if anyone has other questions. Okay, I'll make it short. So <laughs> it started from a residency I did in Malaysia in 2019. 
and Malaysia has Malay, this spoken language is very ancient as part of Estonesia uh, language family, but it never had its own writing system. From 13th to 16th century, it was spelled with Arabic alphabet as uh, the Islamization of Malay archipelago happened. And starting from 19th century, it was written in Roman letters to, as a result of British colonization. And uh, after the independence in the 50s, um, the, uh, Malay had, Malaysia has a big campaign of national language and it was a very uh, vital device for the new, for the reconstruction of national identity. Mm. To separate them from their past and from their surroundings. Um, so I also just found these corals so beautiful. I was, I started to collect them once I arrived. And when I placed them in front of my living place, they naturally had order and categories and they started to resemble a uh, alphabet. And I just started to use them to translate 182 sentences that I found in a local dictionary and in doing so creating a writing system with corals. And yes, I am a translator in between non-human animal and human um, languages. For example, this one means decay and death. For me, it has this um, expression of fading away, of being stripped down, or um, I guess it's because the reality of gravity makes me feel like something that's slowing down is a signal of close to dying or resting. And this is an example, and I find all of these meanings in between a universal consensus and my private index between sound, shape, and meaning. And of course, I am also translating for them. I think they are already expressive and meaningful. I am finding the human equivalent of their um, connotations. Mm. And it was a shock for me to learn that they were animals too. <laughs> I wish you guys could see all of the pieces in person. They're so beautiful. Thank you. They're so beautiful. And the sentences I would say each can are so poetic. They're not like a, the dog went on a walk. They're like so deeply poetic. Uh, that I'm like, when would I use the sentence? But I'm like excited to use the sentence in regular conversation. <laughs> <laughs> just because it seems like such a, a beautiful moment of thinking about, um, I guess, more like utilitarian language, not yeah. verses, but in, with, within the tension of like more poetic language. It's, yeah, it's really, really... I think actually they are very utilitarian oriented, but because they are so specific to this living condition of the tropical time of this culture, um, it become poetry to us. And I think that we started to understand that what's so special about this dictionary, because we don't see sentences so real in dictionary. For English, it has a long history of being taught to non-English speaker. So yeah. there's a um, ocean of sentences that just for people to learn language. So they're empty sentences. They have no feelings, they have no uh, living experience. They yeah. were stripped down to just um, code for, for you to yeah. read. But I think Malay doesn't really have that history of making uh, uh, educational material on Malay language. So all of these sentences come directly from everyday life. We rest at a windy place. She has a pair of earrings on her ears. He's very tired, but his eyes are still open. These are not examples made for people to learn. These are what they said when they yeah. were. I think that's so beautiful that you also said that they um, are utilitarian for folks who already are speaking this language, but feel poetic to us. And I think it's just a good reminder around um, the hyper-regional like essence of language too. Like what I consider to be poetic, they're like, this is regular everyday talk. And I just was like, no, this, this is poetry. I would always say this uh, in a special occasion. Um, yeah, that's really great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
We have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. If wanna, um, I want to be cognizant of time since we said this would go till six, so I don't want to keep people. But um, if you want to um, take a question from there, that might be nice. I will read the first one that's here. It says, I'm wondering if either of the speakers have any thoughts on translation as it relates to African American vernacular English and how it bleeds into mainstream pop culture. We definitely need to take an offline conversation, I have lots to say, or maybe any thoughts around the tension between the visibility and representation of black speech and gesture while it is also being appropriated and profited on by non black people. Whoever you are who uh, sent this question, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll answer really quickly with sort of like an anecdote. Um, my husband and I went to uh, the New National Museum um, in DC at the end of 2019. And there's one portion where um, there are a bunch of like hand signals and gestures with like descriptions of what they mean within African American culture. Um, and there are also like some like words with, that also have um, definitions next to them. Um, and then I have a bunch of books in my home alone. Um, I do a lot of archiving work that are just like dictionaries of black slang or dictionaries of black rhetoric or essays on black rhetoric. Um, and so I think there's two things that are super interesting. The first being um, this deep interest in studying blackness and black language. Um, and what does it mean to be a black person constantly under study? Um, and then this other question for me around why people are deeply interested in understanding with what black people are saying to one another um, and what sort of that, uh, what the meaning of that is. And me not uh, without any uh, sense of, of hyperbole being suspicious of a, the deep desire to translate um, African American vernacular English or interior conversations into a legible language. I think that I'm always suspicious of that. And so when it comes to folks being able to profit um, from um, occasional or strategic use of uh, things that are coded as black gesture or black language. Uh, I feel like this is sort of like the history of uh, American culture, which is to sort of take the excess of what is interesting uh, and profitable and useful um, and using that while disposing of the people who have invented or embodied it. And so for me, there's nothing deeply surprising um, about it. I think that there is something to be said around um, the ways in which, uh, this is maybe to the question I had before, the ways in which, um, in which visibility uh, functions and ways in which uh, hyper visibility uh, can be interrogated more deeply. There's a lot of sharing uh, and there's a lot of sharing without accountability. Uh, there's a lot of like young people who are creating dances and songs and fashion and words and languages and books and all types of things for which they never receive credit or authorship. And it's not about credit and authorship for the sake of. It's about the fact to your point that people are literally profiting and making millions of dollars and the authors of these things are not compensated. So for me, I'm really interested in what does it mean to literally have an interior language or way of speaking. And that's not for like all black people because like all black people are not the same. Um, like the way that I speak to uh, my family in Northern California in my small town in East Palo Alto is very different than how my family in Los Angeles and South Central speaks because we're there are regional differences. There are tons of different differences. Um, so yeah, this is a longer conversation around uh, profiting from blackness while not loving black people uh, at the same time. But I think uh, we, we see this um, sort of extraction happen uh, frequently and we see the giving away happening as well. Um, and I don't think either are to anyone's um, benefit or not to black people's benefit. It's benefiting someone else though, most certainly. Thanks for that answer, Camila. Um, so at 610 now, there's one more um, question in the chat from Paige that we can go over if you have time or we can just kind of end it now um, so that we're not keeping anybody past, past their uh, point of Zoom fatigue. You can, we can answer the question if people want to leave and they'll leave, right? Yeah. That, not, it wasn't me being rude. I was just assuming people, people will take agency over their time. Um, I can read the question and then we can figure out how to answer it. <laughs> um, Paige says, how do you think techniques or abilities for pattern recognition play into the existence of conspiracies? I believe I heard Camille use the term, the phrase false flag, which is the term used in relation to 
flag ops or conspiratorial paranoia around the existence of false flags as we are met as we see manifesting as contemporary phenomena like QAnon. Curious if you have a perspective. Mm, this is a good one. I talked a lot, so I'm gonna pause to see if you two has anything to say about this before. It's Q A L L A. All right. So, what'd you say, Yuchen? Um, phenomena like Q A N O N. Q and on. No, which is. It's like um. I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe them as like a, a particular um, digital community of folks who are engaged in um, representations of the world. I feel like I'm trying to like make this as <laughs> clean as possible. Does anyone else want to do a better job of just saying what they are? Because I'm going to try to uh, police my speech so much that you're not going to know what I'm saying. I see. I don't answer this question. Um, it's a far right conspiracy theory, like a very far right conspiracy theory about a deep state, and it's uh, this kind of very yeah bizarre. Uh, I think, as Camila said, very hard to describe. I think from maybe our positions of, of what exactly it is. They're they're centralized and decentralized simultaneously. They're I would say responsible for a lot of like when you hear about like this politician is like really like a reptile doing X, Y, and Z. Um, yeah, they're, they're engaged in sort of uh, conspiracy theory behavior. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I don't have enough vocabulary to answer this question, but I think my I'm able to read the question and asking Camila needed to explain words it's actually a really good demonstration of <laughs> how I navigate as a non-English speaker the, the everyday life because there are things I don't know and then they become not relatable after a while. Things I don't know at first just move further and further away from me. And uh, it's, like, it's like I'm writing a fiction and whatever I admit into my storylines are the words I know. <laughs> And the words I don't know, no matter how prominent they are, legal words, bank words, they are just not in this novel. And I always enjoy asking my brilliant friends <laughs> to define words to me. And okay. they, it's just like, it, how do you, yeah, they, they clarified, uh, thank you, Paige, they said we don't have to speak about QAnon, <laughs> but they said um, conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories in general. Uh, if we have thoughts about conspiracy theories, I guess, guess in relation to language and pattern recognition. Do you want to go, Camila? Yeah, I, I mean, the I love conspiracy theories, not because I personally uh, believe in them, but I'm really interested in like the psychology of drawing, uh, sort of like creating an ecosystem uh, between many different happenings. Um, so when I think about, um, when I think about uh, conspiracy theories and pattern recognition, this is sort of this process of seeing many things happening and establishing a pattern. And that pattern doesn't necessarily have to be one that exists, but it could be one that is sort of like projected or foisted onto it. And so I'm really interested uh, in what conspiracy theories say about cognition and our reliance on patterns to make sense of the world. Like everything has to be connected in this way because if they're not connected, then how will I make sense of it? rather than being okay with sort of like outlier events. Um, like if something happens within a particular time, like maybe that has nothing to do with this particular moment. But I think with conspiracy theories, there is that tendency to build this very, very dense ecosystem of patterns that sort of churn out almost an algorithmic uh, response. Like if all these things are happening, then this must mean this versus allowing sprawl or for things just not to be in relation to one another. You are an amazing educator because your answer made me have something to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was picturing it as myths. Like, I think it's our, it's human beings' major genius is to lie, to yes. things that's not true. Other than that, we will be living in a world that's just everything that's the case. Mm -hmm. and, but this word is 
senseless, it's brutal, and it's not so, that much to offer. So we envision things, we draw connections, we lie from silence to um, just counterfactual statements. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy theory, well, it's hard to tap into that specific room, but just say theories in general is our impulse to um, impulse, but also a great capacity to weave another reality, literally carrying inside us a reality other than the reality that's there around us. Mm. Yeah, I think what you said makes me also think about the ways in which certain ideas from certain people are immediately rendered conspiracy theories versus just theories or just rendered like what it actually is. And I always tell my husband, everything is conspiracy theory until someone uh, does the study that proves that that person uh, 15 years ago was right. And I think about the times, uh, I think about oftentimes uh, when people say like, they're intentionally doing X, Y, and Z, and they're like, oh my God, you're being so sensitive. And you find out like, no, actually they, they did put that toxic recycling plant in this very poor black neighborhood intentionally. That was not actually an accident. And so I think um, when it comes to conspiracy theories, uh, to your last point, Yuchin, I'm super interested in the ways in which, again, certain things are rendered noise. And so we sort of like push them to the margins and say, this is conspiracy theory, they're just making up things. And then other things are immediately accepted as truth, immediately centered as like sound theory, never questioned. Um, not QAnon, must question that. Uh, but I think in terms of uh, how people relate and make sense of the world, I think patterns make us super comfortable because they create a schema or a sense of organizing. And so I never am surprised when people lean on conspiracy, conspiracy theory, um, because I think in a very disorienting world, people are seeking a narrative to explain a lot of what is happening that feels completely disorienting and without um, an organizing structure. Um, mm -hmm. Which is why I think during times like pandemics, conspiracy theories um, crop up because it is a disorienting time and it's people trying to make sense using a narrative structure when I think that narrative structures of beginning, middle and end and causality um, don't really work uh, in times of crisis because that causal relationship just may not exist or there may be too great of a distance between the cause and the effect. We were trying to map all these other things before the other thing that actually is the thing we're looking at. Yes. The, actually, coronavirus started as a conspiracy. Yeah. A doctors who try to, uh, try to warn their families and friends that there is such thing happening, this unusual virus, was criticized by the police. Police, actually. Mm -hmm. as which turned out to be <laughs> truer than everything else now but they had to sign this paper to admit that it was not true and they were never uh, spreading non-factual um, mm. messages again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, end, we end on the most depressing note. In a pandemic, and people lie, and conspiracy theories. Thanks for coming to our talk. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to read the last comments and then maybe we can close out. Um, Ga uh, Gabrielle is a beautiful answer, Yu Chen, uh, about a novel not containing certain language and words. Heather noted, it seems like the extreme reaction to discomfort with unknowing, rather than accepting a limit to one's ability to know, conspiracies create a false sense of knowing for one's comfort um, or a lack of control what's known, who is controlling the narrative, pure 2020. Grace, uh, thank you for the relation between crisis and the limits of narrative is so interesting. Thank you for this framing. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all of you guys. Um, this was, this was fun. Um, <laughs> how, Lily, do we just, do we just say bye? Is that what happens? Yeah, we can just say bye. Thank you so much, Camila and Yuchen. This was <laughs> wonderful. It's, it is very much a pleasure to listen to you two uh, speak and think. So thank you. Bye guys. Take care. Bye. Ah!